having me. So I want to get right into uh, Hurricane Sandy. We just did a special edition podcast, kind of a quick update after or during the hurricane. Can you just give us kind of an idea what's what's happened here a few days later? Yeah, the um, the NRC is not really telling too too much, but uh, uh, New Jersey got hit the worst, and uh, uh, Oyster Creek got hit the worst of all the nuclear plants in New Jersey. Uh, just like I said on Democracy Now!, even before the with the hurricane. What happened at Oyster Creek was uh, the power went out, the off-site power went off, uh, called loss of off-site power. And then um, the Barnegat Bay started to rise um, and uh, entered the intake structure and um, was either just below or just above the the safety-related pumps. They're called service water pumps. Uh, one report says it was six and a half feet, and the limit is seven. And another report said it's almost seven and a half feet. So either it was a hair below or a hair above the uh, the design height of these um, these service water pumps. What happens if they go underwater? Well, a, a nuclear reactor's got to be cooled even after it's shut down. It's not about the chain reaction. It's about these uh, decay products that are left behind. And these pumps are what cool the plant when it's not running. Um, Oyster Creek had been down for a week and was in a refueling mode. So um, all the nuclear fuel was out of the nuclear reactor and uh, over in the fuel pool. So the, um, the, the fuel pool had to be, um, had to be cooled um, as opposed to the safety systems that, that you'd have in place after um, when the plant's running. What happened uh, uh, next is that um, the, there's something called a PNO out, which stands for a preliminary notice of uh, occurrence. And the NRC has said that, that uh, uh, the, the normal uh, shutdown cooling and the, um, and the fuel pool cooling were both lost at Oyster Creek and also that there was a loss of offsite power. Now, so what that means is that the nuclear fuel pool started to heat up. And uh, Oyster Creek started to um, uh, bring in some diesel fire pumps. Uh, uh, apparently, they got the situation rectified before turning the pumps on. But um, you know, they were in a position where they were bringing in diesel fire pumps in order to keep the nuclear fuel pool cool um, because of all the problems that they were having as a result of Sandy. Since Hurricane Sandy, the industry has really been bragging about how well their plants handled the hurricane. Uh, what can you say about that? Well, at Oyster Creek, I, I don't think it handled it well at all. Um, um, it's the oldest plant in the country, and um, uh, it was built in 1969, so it's 44 years old. And uh, um, I think the, the, what everybody seems to forget is that as a nuclear fuel pool gets hot, it starts to steam. You know, we've seen the pictures of the steam pouring out of the Fukushima fuel pool, for instance. Um, the building that the uh, fuel pool is in at Oyster Creek isn't designed to handle all that moisture. So, you know, the industry says, well, let's run some pumps in and, and make up for the, all the steam that's coming out. But, of course, the problem is that the, the uh, humidity goes up in the building and all the wires start to short out. So it's not something that's been analyzed by the nuclear industry. High humidity in the reactor building is not something these plants are designed to withstand. So if I understand then, the water typically circulates through the fuel pool, but in this case it's getting hot, evaporating off, and they're just using fire pumps to put fresh water in. You got it. The, the normal temperature of a fuel pool is around 80 degrees, and um, it, it would, if there was no, uh, no, no electricity and, and no pumps whatsoever, it would begin to boil in about 24 hours. So. Um, you know, that's 300,000 gallons of water. So you think about it, going from 80 to 212 and beginning to boil in, in less than a day, there's an enormous amount of heat in there. And that means there's an enormous amount of steam. So, yeah, if the um, uh, making up for what steams out of a nuclear fuel pool is not a solution because you're creating all this moisture that drips on the walls and causes all sorts of electrical problems. So... Um, Apparently, and again, the reports are, uh, won't be out for a long time if the NRC has anything to do with it, but um, apparently they, um, the pool did start to heat up, um, but not so much that uh, uh, they turned the, the, uh, the fire pumps on. They were able to get the other systems back in place and begin to cool the pool before um, needing the fire pumps. So Hurricane Sandy, uh, this, this event, 
uh, you know, there was no need for an evacuation due to the nuclear plant. But talk about if there were a need for an evacuation due to a nuclear plant. Uh, how, how is that possible in a hurricane? You know, all the um, evacuation plans assume a, a nice sunny day. Uh, yet the, you know, Fukushima's taught us and, and now Oyster Creek has taught us that uh, it's likely that it will be a, an act of God, some sort of a, you know, tornado, hurricane, or whatever. Um, and uh, that area in New Jersey was decimated. I mean, roads were flooded, houses were washing down the street. It's kind of hard to evacuate when there's a house in your way, you know. The, um, uh, the other problem was that all of the emergency sirens were knocked out. So the plant was in, a, in an emergency situation um, uh, called an alert status. It had no sirens, and all the streets were either clogged with sand, houses, or water. Um, how could you have evacuated? Now, if Oyster Creek had been running, um, this would have been much more serious because uh, uh, the, the service water was compromised and uh, it would have been difficult to cool the nuclear reactor. Um, you know, it's, a, uh, it's just one of those lucky things that it happened to be in a refueling outage as opposed to have been, uh, been operating. It lost its service water for a period of time. It lost its ability to cool itself for a period of time. The industry seems to think that's, um, that's acceptable, and I don't. You know, it's not the only plant in New Jersey that had problems. On the opposite coast of New Jersey, on the Delaware Bay side, um, the, um, the, a plant called Salem was operating. And um, uh, of course, water is very high because this low pressure is creating the the, uh, the water to rise in the bay. And then a a large wave came in and knocked out five of the six circulating pumps. Now they're not safety related, but the plant was running at 100% power and had to suddenly stop. One wonders the wisdom of why are you running a plant when waves are crusting into your service into your circulating pumps. Um, but in any event, it's down uh, for perhaps an extended amount of time. You know, it's hard to get salt water out of a pump. You know, drop your hair dryer in the, uh, in the kitchen sink someday and then try to turn it on and see what happens. Well, these hair dryers are, are thousands of horsepower. So um, it, uh, it could be a, a, a long period of time before any of these pumps um, is serviceable again. So you've talked a lot about design bases in the past, um, and I want to talk about that again. But first, can you just explain what design bases means in nuclear power? Yeah, you know, when, they, when you build a, a house, you build it to a, a building code. And, uh, you know, here, here in Vermont, we assume four feet of snow. And, and in uh, uh, Florida, you don't have to assume four feet of slow snow. So uh, the building code for different structures depends on where you are. But the building code is based on history, and, and usually building codes are based on the worst thing that can happen in 100 years for, for a normal civilian structure. So a skyscraper in San Francisco would be built differently than a skyscraper in New York. Right, right. Um, and uh, because there's different, um, uh, different issues that, uh, uh, you know, the seismic issues in San Francisco, likely the hurricane issues in New York are, are, are offsetting, yeah. So now a nuclear plant, what they'll do is they'll go back in time and they'll look at the worst flood in perhaps 500 years, um, the, worst, um, the, the worst earthquake in, uh, in a period of time. And uh, the, they make a decision that uh, that, whatever that worst earthquake is or whatever that worst flood is, is what's called the design basis event. And they, they designed the plant to withstand the worst that they found in history going back a couple thousand years. Well, we've had uh, five events that have either exceeded or been right at the hairy edge of design bases events in the last eight, 18 months. And that's a concern because we're talking about events that should never happen. And we've had five of these things since, um, uh, since March of last year. We had um, two seismic events. We had the, the earthquake at, at Fukushima Daiichi that likely did damage to unit one and, and perhaps the unit four fuel pool. Tokyo Electric went in and braced the heck out of it um, after, the, um, a after the accident. Um, and then uh, here, in, here in, um, uh, on the East Coast, we had a, uh, a, a, an earthquake over at um, North Anna. And that was a, a Richter six. Well, 
North Anna was designed for a Richter 6, and it was still a Richter 6, and that's, that's good. Um, but the point is not that. The point is, if a Richter 6 happened in 30 years, what could happen? What's the worst that could happen? We're talking about uh, an event that should happen only once every 20 or 30,000 years. So the once in a thousand year event, or once in 30,000 year event happened at North Anna after only 30 years. So what does that tell us about how well we've looked back in time and, and what East Coast earthquakes um, really could be to a nuclear plant? We're in that area of the low probability, high consequence thing. We're not talking about once in 100 years. That, that's not an adequate time frame to build a nuclear plant because you're dealing with something that can destroy a state. Um, the, the other three were floods. We had a, um, obviously we had the tsunami at, uh, at Fukushima. Um, we had the flood at Fort Calhoun. And now we had this, uh, f the Frankenstorm, you know, Sandy, uh, up the East Coast. And um, in all three of those, the pumps that cool the plant, uh, the service water pumps, were, um, uh, were at the hairy edge of what they were designed for at uh, Fort Calhoun, um, likely uh, over what they were designed for at, um, uh, at Oyster Creek, and certainly over what they were designed for at, at Fukushima. So we've got um, uh, situations that could create something we call the loss of the ultimate heat sink. And uh, again, you can build a plant, you can harden a nuclear plant so it can withstand a, a tsunami or a, a tidal uh, flood like we had at uh, Oyster Creek with something called submersible pumps. But the industry doesn't want to spend that money. So what, what, what my advice is we need to go back in time and look at what we have as a, as a country determined to be design basis events and say, did we really make these plants strong enough? Because you know we've got a we've got a an earthquake, um, a couple floods um, that uh, that might indicate that we're not uh, building the nuclear plants as strong as they should be. So you're not arguing that the design bases, whatever a plant is built build to withstand, that it would withstand, but rather that there's not much of a, I guess I'd say margin of safety if it's just a little bit more than what it was built to withstand, then then there's a problem. Yeah, let's, let's look at North Anna. You know, we're hearing uh, the, the, the people that run the North Anna reactor say, well, it withstood the, 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 the Richter 6 earthquake or 5.8 or something like that, close. And of course it should. I mean, the engineers designed it to withstand a Richter 6, and they had a Richter 6. The problem is that if a Richter 6 happened in 30 years, then what's the probability of something worse? And it's got to be significant. And uh, therefore, you don't build a nuclear plant for what happens every 30 years. You build a plant for what happens every 1,000 years. And uh, we're not building them uh, uh, rigorously enough. So you're talking about building a nuclear plant to withstand a 1,000-year event. But of course, with climate change, you know, isn't all of this changing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you, let's take a look at, um, at Oyster Creek. It was, it was finished in 1969, which meant it was started in 1960-62. And engineers in 1962 looked back over the historical record and determined what the, what the worst hurricane was that could hit the area. Well, in the 55 years since this plant was designed, there's been a lot of global warming effects. And so suddenly now, we're seeing a lot more energy in our storms than were anticipated when these plants were built 50 years ago. Um, the same thing at, at Fort Calhoun. Um, that was the plant that was completely surrounded, and my quote there was, sandbags and nuclear plants don't belong in the same sentence. That plant um, never anticipated uh, that uh, the, the Missouri River would be a mile wide. Um, and um, uh, it was only uh, because of a little bit of proactive work by the NRC, thank you NRC, two years before, that, that forced them to um, increase their floodworthiness, uh, that, that, that Fort Calhoun was able to weather that flood. You know, it's very rare that I pat the NRC on the back, but, but uh, that was one, Fort Calhoun. And I actually have a second one. The, um, uh, the NRC did something this week that, uh, that I'm proud of them for. Uh, this is uh, the NRC staff met with the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards down in Washington and recommended that all of these old boiling water reactors, the Mark I and Mark II designs, 
uh, have filtered hardened vents installed on their containment. And uh, the industry didn't want that, and I doubt the nuclear regulatory commissioners want it. But the staff stood firm and, um, uh, and pushed for something that uh, frankly surprised me that they were so adamant that it, uh, a safety modification that needed to be made. What are containment vents? Well, the, the Mark I containment is this little inverted light bulb with a, a donut on the bottom. Um, and uh, it was too small. And people knew it was too small in the 70s. Now, I think they should all be shut down, and I'm on record that, that they should be. Um, but w when people realized that the Mark I and Mark II containments could overpressurize, um, the industry was able to convince the NRC that they shouldn't shut them down, but they could put a vent in the side of the containment. You know, if you're going to contain, you contain. If you're going to vent, you vent. But you don't call it a containment if you've got a hole in the side of it. Well, all of those vents failed at, at Fukushima Daiichi, and, the, and all the containments leaked, and, and the Unit 1, 2, and 3 all had explosions. So we know that filtered vents didn't work at Fukushima Daiichi, and um, uh, the, the NRC now was, uh, is, is demanding something called a hardened filtered vent, which is a little bit stronger Band-Aid than the Band-Aid that's on these plants now. So then, Arnie, I assume there's a reason we're talking about containment venting right now. This is a this is a, an old issue. This has been around as long as the Mark I BWRs have been around. Why are we talking about it now? Well, you know, the, 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 um, that, that the hearing was this week is, is, is obviously uh, awfully important. Um, and uh, I think the other piece of that is that uh, uh, here's uh, Oyster Creek was was exactly that design, so we've got a uh, uh, you know a, a problem at a Mark One reactor just like Daiichi One, and um, uh, with a uh, with a simultaneously a hearing in Washington on that same type reactor design, so it's a, it's a confluence of uh, of events that uh, um, I, I just really felt like I owed it to the NRC staff. Uh, to thank them for standing up for hardened filtered vents. At least it's a stronger Band-Aid than the Band-Aid we had before. But it will cost industry. It's going to cost the, around $20 million bucks per plant. And if you remember the conversation we had last week, some of these plants are on the hairy edge of shutting down for economic reasons. So it's, uh, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back and forces some of these plants to, um, to shut down because no one wants to spend another $20 million on a 40-plus-year-old um, plant. And that's going to bring us, I, I suppose, to our next topic of conversation. The uh, Vogel plant in Georgia uh, is coming with a price tag, if you can talk about that. Yeah, the, the, last week we talked about how the Kiwani plant was, uh, was being shut down for economic reasons. Now, th this is a plant that was uh, 37 years old, but had a license to run till 60 years old. And it only cost $200 million, um, when it was bought in, uh, in, in 2005. And it was shut down by the company that owned it because they couldn't make any money. The nuclear plant staff and the fuel costs and all were much too high for the, the electric market that's out there now. Well, down in Georgia, they're building a, a two plants at, uh, at Vogel, and uh, those plants uh, are going to be pushing $15 billion by the time they're done in 2016. Um, they're claiming it might be $10 billion, but in fact, there will obviously be, be cost overruns. Now, um, t this week, there was a lawsuit between the people building the plant and the people owning the plant. And the, uh, the people building it say that the uh, cost is going to increase by almost a billion dollars, $900 million cost increase. Now, this plan is nowhere near done, so I'm sure there'll be more cost increases coming up. But a $900 million cost increase that they want the, the Vogel plant to absorb. Let me make sure I'm understanding this. We talked about the Kiwani plant that was a $200 million plant and it's being shut down for economic reasons. And this plant is $10 billion at minimum? Yeah, the cost increase at this plant is $900 million, which is you know, five times more than the Kiwani plant ever cost. And yet um, Kiwani's shutting down, and uh, Vogel's basically saying, damn, the torpedo's full speed ahead. 
<laughs> what's their plan to make money? Well, the, the Public Service Commission in Georgia is co-opted and, and uh, controlled by the, by the utilities that it's supposed to be regulating. And basically what they're doing is they're, they're guaranteed 11% return on their money. So they're going to pony up, uh, you know, let's say use $10 billion, but they're going to get 11% for the life of the plant. This is a good deal for the utility. Now, the bad deal is for the people in Georgia because uh, they're stuck with a plant that's going to have enormous costs, and their rates are going to go up uh, enormously. The, the, um, the, the cost at the bus bar, which is where the electricity leaves these nuclear plants, will be two to three times more than other sources on the grid. So why is Georgia doing this? It's a, it's a great question, and I, I wish I had a good logical answer. Um, I don't have a logical answer. The, um, uh, the, the Public Utility Commission is not looking out for the people of Georgia, but instead is making a real lucrative deal with the people that are building the, uh, the Vogel reactor. It sounds like, to me, the owners of the Vogel reactor have a better financial situation than Fairwinds Energy Education. Yeah, I, I think they'll <laughs> spend more on lawyers' fees in a day than um, than Fairwinds uh, uses in a year to keep this uh, this site up and running. Um, which, dear viewers, I hope you can uh, you can do something about. Um, uh, any contribution is great. We're we're grateful for and and every day when I walk to the mail and and, and find a, a a note and a check, I am forever grateful. Um, but we we do need funds, and uh, if you haven't contributed, uh, uh, we would we would love to have contributions because, um, frankly, we have uh, uh, we have bills to pay, servers to run, um, broadcasts to put up, and Maggie and I aren't pulling any money out of this, but uh, it does cost money to run the site. So let's think of uh, the Vogel plant and, and nine hundred million dollar cost overruns. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll take uh, one-tenth of one percent <laughs> of that. <laughs> last, last bit for this podcast, Arnie. We have a listener question uh, asking uh, – we have a listener writing us in. He's asking why when radio, radioactivity measurements are taken, why are we only seeing cesium being reported? Why not any of the other radioactive isotopes that we know are out there? Well, well the Fukushima Daiichi plant released – hundreds of different isotopes. A lot have decayed away already. Um, but cesium is uh, particularly easy to find. Um, it, it gives off some very characteristic energy, and uh, you can say, whoop, that particular decay was definitely cesium. So we measure cesium because it's easy to measure. That doesn't mean that the only thing out there is cesium. Uh, we know there's other isotopes, but they're much more difficult to measure. You know, cesium is a, is a muscle seeker, and you find it in, um, in the meat of a fish um, or the meat of a cow, for instance. Uh, but other isotopes like strontium are bone seekers, and they're much more difficult to detect when they're in a fish or when they're in, in a cow because you've got to separate it out from the bone. And, and uh, it's a very elaborate chemical procedure to, um, uh, to measure cesium, um, to measure strontium. strontium. Right. Uh, in the environment. So uh, there, there are um, dozens of isotopes uh, still out there. Uh, when we talk about cesium, it's just because it's the easiest one to measure. Arnie, thanks for coming on today. I'm glad I could. This podcast has been a presentation of Fairwinds Energy Education. You can catch us back here next Sunday and every Sunday to keep current on what's happening in the world of nuclear news. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening.